Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us on this panel on location-based immersive entertainment. Uh, with a premium group of panelists. Um, uh, with me uh, here are uh, James Fong, uh, CEO of uh, John China and former CEO of, uh, of Oriental DreamWorks. Um, Joanna Popper, Global Head of VR at Hewlett Packard. Uh, Jennifer Cook, uh, VP of Production at Dreamscape Immersive. And last but not least, uh, John Canning, EP of Digital Domain and former VP of NBCU. Um, so, Quick question, um, you guys. Um, all the, your companies are involved uh, in location-based at various uh, different levels. What exactly are you doing uh, in location-based? How do we want to start? How do we want to start? Tell you, baby. You Tell me. <laughs> all right. So, so John China, we're a joint venture between John in the U.S. and China Media Capital and Shanghai Media Group. So we are very focused on building immersive location-based content and a building a distribution platform for the Chinese market. And for China, I mean greater China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Macau, and, and uh, of course PRC. Um, and the thing that we're working on and we're trying to solve is trying to go find out what is the best way to produce very compelling immersive content that can be experienced outside of the home in a, an immersive environment, whether it be a kiosk, a theater, uh, a cinema, uh, a museum, or exhibition space, and all of these um, uh, off location, uh, all these location uh, have a very unique set of offerings. People go there for different reasons. Kiosks, much more for um, compulsive, impulsive uh, experience. I'm waiting in line. There's a kiosk there, kind of like a KTV kiosk. You go there. Um, cinema. So you know, you, eventually, we hope that you can actually go there to watch a VR movie. But right now, it's a lot of it is attached. You're going to a movie. The content you see may be related to the movie you just saw, so you want to have that immersive experience. Exhibition uh, for museums and others is much more artsy. It's much more about a, 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 in, a immersive experiences. You might want to go there to see uh, things around documentaries, uh, thing based. And then, of course, there's tour sites. So you go to these uh, specific tours locations, and you find these uh, um, uh, various uh, um, uh, location, uh, VR uh, entertainment content that you can enjoy. Some of them have to do with the location themselves. Some of them are just pure fun, like a roller coaster ride or some kind of a ride, like they have one in Oriental, the, 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 the Oriental Pearl Tower in Shanghai. You can actually do a roller coaster, and, and that the flight that takes you, that flies you um, around Shanghai. So those are, those are the things that we're trying to go figure out. It's what is the best immersive content and also trying to build a distribution platform with enough content so the operators can focus on operating while we focus on finding the best uh, content to distribute. Hi, I'm Joanna Popper. I head up our location-based entertainment for virtual reality at HP. So at HP, we are focused on inventing and reinventing the future in technology. We're one of the earliest companies in Silicon Valley. Our actual first customer was, was Walt Disney the, himself, not, not the company, but the actual, the actual man, <laughs> the man. Um, and so we've had a long history working with and in and around entertainment and media. Um, so we, we uh, as a company though, you know, we, we very much see VR as the future of computing. And so we think it's very important for us to be very involved in helping to build that and bring, bring that forth to the world. And we focus on partnering with B2B uh, B2B partners, we have four industry sectors, which are architecture, engineering, construction, location-based entertainment, um, training with some focus on military and first responder, and healthcare as the industries that we're, that we're focused on. Um, and then within the location-based entertainment vertical, our two main partners we work with are location-based entertainment operators and content creators. Hi, I'm Jenny Cook from Dreamscape Immersive. So I think our company's fairly new to this VR world. We're just babies at about two years old as a company. And I think the best description about what Dreamscape is about is created from the DNA of who makes up Dreamscape. Our co-founders, Walter Parks and Kevin Walls, um, both come from the world of Walter Parks' is an EPs, made over 50 movies, worked with Steven Spielberg. Kevin Walls put on major events, Live 8, Live Aid. And they were at Sundance, and I'm sure a lot of you heard Cherie talk about how she curates a great Sundance show. And 
they met with the Ardman team who are out of Geneva. They were representing how to approach VR in a different way and they were looking at it saying they love the medium of VR but they wanted it to be something that was more social. It was very isolating to go in alone in a headset. So they came up with the idea of creating a new technology and a platform that would allow multiplayers go in together. And that whole goal was for entertainment and bonding purposes. That sparked a whole company and hence Dreamscape was born. And they pulled in people like Bruce Vaughn, our CEO, who comes from the world of Walt Disney Imagineering. And he was there for over 20 years, launched Shanghai Disney. He really understands the idea of guest flow, guest entertainment, the entire guest journey, so that you don't just approach it as come watch our show leave and we don't talk to you before or after. We want to involve you in that entire story, the entire journey from the moment you think about coming and hear it to the moment you've left and even thereafter. So we are fully about making immersive storytelling. We love utilizing gaming mechanics, but we absolutely are not doing gaming. There is a whole world and a market for that, and it's amazing. And what we're differentiating ourselves is about the immersive storytelling. We use, people say full senses, but we have yet to use taste, and thank God. So we use all the other senses. We, we create a story, we carry our guests through, we want them to bond with each other, we want them to feel accomplishment. I think Sean's talk this morning was amazing, talking about the guest being, you know, the, when you're in an immersive story, you can become the hero of that story. We use that concept as well, and then we add physical haptics to create sensory memories to follow along with the entire story. We are about doing location-based. We are launching our flagship in the fall, and we will have permanent locations. We're putting up about four to six theaters in each, and the idea is to have have programming going on in there so we have content rolling through, refreshing it constantly. So we're going to be making at least eight to ten pieces every year and refreshing the content and it is both domestic and international. So we'll launch domestic but we're following quickly after that internationally. Oh wait, domestic US, that's right, I apologize. Back in the US. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? <laughs> 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 Enough panels together. <laughs> You're just going to finish each other's sentences yeah, at this point. <laughs> uh, I'm John Canning. I am the executive producer of AR, VR, and Interactive with Digital Domain. So Digital Domain has had a long history of doing cinema quality visual effects for film and television. Um, and you know now we have an XR division which is focused on building out experiences really across the continuum of the opacity, as I like to put it, from the AR side of things all the way to the full immersive. Um, and in the location-based experiences, we have a partner here uh, called DD Spaces. Uh, so deployed over 30 adjunct to theater cinemas uh, that are full, full articulated chairs, uh, deploying content experiences that are designed from the consumer acquisition, so walking up and selecting the experience through the experience, whether it's individual or group-based, uh, being able to pick different experiences, and it's an adjunct to the theaters. So being able to watch either something that may be promotional to what's in the theater, but also other kinds of experiences in that. Um, and from digital domains perspective, looking at being able to build that high quality cinematic experience that uh, immerses a consumer in the different kinds of entertainment uh, and being able to bring that at the highest quality possible. All right. Um, so we've seen that uh, you have very different um, uh, approaches each to uh, to uh, how where where you're positioned in the value chain of the of location based. Um, there's a lot of people probably in this room, uh, creators, maybe um, operators, uh, who have uh, approached location based for for some time now, and there's. I don't know if it's a debate, but a discussion uh, going on about where to take this industry in order to make it take off. Uh, and one of the key uh, questions that I want to ask you is, where do you stand on the debate against, should we um, shoot for high-end, uh, expensive experiences um, versus uh, maybe more approachable, easily deployable exp uh, experiences? So should we shoot for... Uh, again, um, uh, high quality, um, uh, expensive experiences, or maybe broaden the scope of, uh, of, uh, of the experiences. Bring it on over. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually think there's a market for multiples, and so it's really defining who you are as a business and what your company is going to offer. So for Dreamscape, we're going for the premium. 
Uh, there is nothing, there is arcade VR that's out there, and as long as we all want good content, so that there's a market for that, there's a market for gaming. We are really looking for that family entertainment location you can go to where you can do multiple experiences, there's a social space, but when we say the word dreamscape, we want to create content that you understand the level of quality that we're going to establish for that. That's our goal as a company, and so I think everybody can speak to different types, but I don't think there's a negative unless we put out bad content for everybody, and we all talk about that at every panel. We need good content. I, th I absolutely agree that I think there's a wide range in, in looking at what either the place you're putting this entertainment, um, the kind of experiences that are, you know, for that demographic in that area, uh, and also focusing on whether it is the fun group-based experience that they're going to come back every Friday night for something. Um, is it more of a theatrical kind of experience? But it's, again, constantly focusing on giving a high quality experience to that, whether it's they do it once and they're like, great, that was amazing, or they keep coming back, you, you want to leave them satisfied, regardless of where on that continuum you're building experience. Well, we work with operators all across that, that spectrum uh, in terms of how they're, they're building their business model. I think that it's, it's very early in terms of the commercialization of the business models to say this one will be successful or that one will be successful. Um, as you guys both mentioned, there's probably different spaces for, for both of them. So, um, you know, it, 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 uh, I just spent five days in Beijing prior to prior to coming to this festival and got to see some really amazing. And one of you, one of your colleagues actually took me around. So thank, thank you. Tanya was fantastic. I got to see some very different ways of approaching location-based entertainment here in China as, as, uh, compared to the ways that we have it in the United States right now. And so I think it's going probably going to not only differ by business model, but by market and by use case and by you know, really looking at who that demographic and, and what that right content is for that, for that moment. I, I totally agree with Joanna because one of the, I mean, and everything else, I think content, the, cons the only consistency that I see is content quality. We all strive for content quality. But the markets are really, really different. Like, um, you know, the malls in the US and the malls in China are very different experiences. Putting something that works in China may not necessarily work in the US and vice versa. I mean, John US does completely different things than we do. They're much more online, we're completely offline. So, so I think that, that is really important to understand where does your customer will be and what content do you want to produce for them. Um, for, for John China, we're trying to figure that out. We, we don't know what it is yet. We're looking at the broad spectrum of the space. And the problem, the question that we're trying to answer for ourselves every day is, what do we need to do to build superior quality content for our customers? Another question I want to ask you uh, regarding content, and uh, it's also interesting because you all have ties to um, uh, film and uh, in, in general, which is IP or original content. I think, uh, I'll just start and we'll work our way down, but um, I think you have to look at it that IP has the benefit of being known by the audience. It can be a draw. Um, it, it, you know, it has that, recon like I said, that recognizing factor. The problem is, is that it does come with challenging business models at times. Um, anybody that likes to work with a lot of lawyers should probably go after IP based. Um, <laughs> And brand management, uh, the bigger the brand, the more recognizable, but also the more challenging to do that. Uh, and the, the layers of getting it right, the pressure of doing an IP-based product, you, you don't want to mess up that because it's very recognizable. Um, but you, it, it helps create sometimes a stakehold uh, for other kinds of experiences you can bring. Um, but it also depends on where you're deploying the experiences. If you're using that to draw people in the door as opposed to someplace for example, uh, here in China where we're deployed with theaters, people are coming in the door, they're you know, seeing other kinds of experiences, they're coming in the door for that movie that is playing in the back of the house. They may then experience other things. So it depends what the draw is and where you're putting that location, I think, as well. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Uh, we are looking at both for our company because you want that evergreen, you want that draw, that pull, and you want to, you want to match to that quality, quality level of that licensed known product that's out there, but 
being a creative studio and pointing out that we can create internally something that is pure original IP is very important to us. We launched <clears throat> with Alien Zoo, which was our first piece, and that was actually IP. Originally, we had talked about not doing that. And I think we wanted to establish our name and say we, we do both. I think everything John said is incredibly true and what we have all gone through about dealing with dealing with product that's out there, it already comes with a standard that the audience expects, so you have to match to it. And we know in VR that can tend to be challenging. It comes with brand management that is a hurdle in itself. Having worked with Disney at Disney for over 21 years, I was on the other side of that. And I know how tough we are with people. So you have to be ready to accept that challenge. But I think a model that does both is the most successful. I don't think you can go down a path of doing one or the other and be viable. So the obvious upside of established IP is that you know we're we're working in a new medium, so you're you're bringing people to a new type of experience, and then you're also when you have new new technology experience, and then you're adding on it new content experience. It's a lot of it's a lot of new 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 together. So um, and at least in the U.S., most of the companies aren't spending a tremendous amount of their money to on marketing yet to drive people in the door. So um, what IP does for you is it, it you know, cuts some of that marketing cost out because people do have an expectation and an understanding of what the IP will be. So that's, I think, an upside of working with IP. However, I would say the majority of the sort of best content experiences I've seen to this point, and of course there's some exceptions, but those would be experiences that are native to VR, and they were built by people who are working primarily in VR and around VR, and they're not, whereas many of the IPs, again, not 100%, but many are done with like some little extra money for a broader campaign, and so they weren't really endemic to VR in the same way. So while you might get excited about going to do a content experience that you, you're, you're familiar with that world and that world building, the, the VR experience might not be quite as great to this point. And again, there's a few exceptions, but I would say arguably more of the better experiences today are original IP. Um, we do a mix. Um, so I shy away from big name IPs because uh, I, don't, I, I don't have enough money to afford lawyers. <laughs> uh, that you, you guys, they laugh because they know. So if you, if you haven't done with any of these big five studios, trust me, you're better off paying a lot of money for a lawyer to get yourself, alleviate yourself some headaches. But, but we, we do, what we do is we actually work with emerging IPs, either IPs that's about to hit the market in terms of the movies, but they haven't proven themselves yet. We're making some bets, but, but we're betting on the fact that they're going to pump money into the marketing of that particular movie, and then they're gonna be able to carry the, 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 the property along. Um, we're also working with IP that have one or two hits, but hasn't made it really big yet either. So they're much more flexible in terms of taking risks, trying to carve out new areas of monetization or experiment with new ways of having, of bringing this new IP to a different story. Uh, the third part of uh, emerging IP that we work with is actually with emerging artists, uh, directors or creators that have done well in other IPs, they have new ideas that they want to bring on the table, but, you know, but they feel like VR might be a great opportunity for them to test the water. So instead of you know, publishing a comic book or, or writing a serial, they're gonna go ahead and invest some money and we're gonna to work together and bring a new story to life. And then maybe then, then, that then can become a, an IP in of itself in terms of movies or, or some kind of a web series or, 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 or a cable series uh, franchise. So those are the things that we sort of making bets on. It's more, more on the emerging part rather than the more established. We have a few originals ourselves that we do, but that's a lot of it is just get our, keeping our muscle, uh, uh, keeping, uh, keeping up, uh, building up our muscles, um, experimenting with things that we may not want to try with established or emerging IPs, uh, very experimental stuff that we're doing our, on ourselves with our own original IP. But we spread our, our bets pretty much along the, 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 the latter two rather than you know, going after the big five studio uh, IPs. All right, well, thanks for those insights on, uh, on content. Uh, I'd like to move on now to uh, deployment um, of uh, LBVR. So you all have different relationships um, to, to operators. Um, so I'd like to, to know where um, uh, your experiences or your solutions are uh, being deployed uh, right now, um, and what kind of challenges you had to overcome, which may be different um, uh, depending on the, the, the type of venues that you work with. 
uh, and maybe I'd like to start with um, uh, uh, James. Sorry to <laughs> to put the spotlight on you, but there's there's um, uh, also a question about uh, we're in China here. Maybe you have some specific insights about the the market in uh, in uh, in China. Um, you know, I wish I had insight to help to share. Um, I think <laughs> the operators are actually you know it's a very new market. Um, there's not that many scalable operators. I think digital DD space might be the the, the more scalable ones in terms of the cinemas. So if you look at, so there's, again, everything is on the segmentation. So there's over 3,000 different VR locations in China. Some of them are considered arcade, some of them are cinema, some of them are a lot of different experiences. There's a lot of little things that you aggregate them together, you call them VR, it looks kind of big. But when you break them down into various small segments of operating, they're actually not that big. So, so we're, we're experimenting a lot with scalable deployments. I think DD Space, John, you can probably talk a lot with that. I mean, I talked to Zhang Ling, which is their CEO of DD Spaces, and we agonize over deployment a lot just because it is new. You're go and, and China makes it even more complicated because the, 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 um, the consistency of Chinese cities varies greatly between tier one, let's say, and tier four. So for example, like movie ticket sales in tier one, is 50% more expensive than tier four. So when you go ahead and deploy your uh, 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 locations, you're gonna have to take that pricing into account, which then affects your ROI, which then affects what you can, what's, what's reasonable you can, hardware and content you can bring to particular locations. So that, that is really, really hard. The other thing that's really hard is there's not a set standards. So we as distributors, we create tremendous amount of, we see a lot of content. And, and we bring them to the table. And what we, the value that we bring to the table is whatever content that, that creators bring to us, our job is to make sure that it plays with whatever format that gets out there. So we go through a transcoding or transform process that we, we go, go through and go do that. We do that for headsets, we do that for chairs, we do that for other type of uh, 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 experience formats. But because there's no standards, it's extremely labor intensive and for us to go make the conversion itself, and then also maintaining that conversion. So, you know, there's new chair, I have to constantly go back and make sure everything is backward compatible, forward compatible, and so on and so forth. So if there's any way for us to go resolve that, that will, that will help a lot. Third thing is, is data. So in the film industry, you know, all the tickets goes out, everybody knows exactly, there's a, there's a, there's a audited uh, official database that everybody pulls the numbers from. There's, there's nothing like that from here. So how do we go about making sure that, you know, um, whatever the, the, the creator get paid, the distributor get paid, and, the con and then the operator gets paid in, in, a, in a way that's according to the contract. There's no way for us to go really check that right now. So, so that's, another that's another operating hurdle that we need to get, get through. And of course, there's the, the, of course, there's the technical aspect of it is how do you deploy all the content through all these different locations. Um, and film is really easy because now everything is done through the internet, there's a key, and so on and so forth. There's a very sophisticated process to go do it. In VR, we, we haven't figured out what that is yet. So from HP, we work with uh, the operators and content creators on the hardware side and solution side. So we have you know, VR-capable computers, we have towers, laptops, the backpacks that Ted so lovely, lovely showed in, in his slide yesterday, and he shrunk it. Um, and <laughs> thanks, Ted, for the awesome shrinking backpack. Um, and we also make some we make some headsets, and then we resell some of the other headsets that are in the market. So that that's what we have today. You know, obviously, as all of this industry is is still relatively new, we continue to work very, very closely with the operators and the content creators and get feedback and iterate on, on what we have um, you know, for our, ex our existing solutions and continue to, we'll continue to roll out n new and better, better solutions. So ho hopefully the, uh, the nearly invisible backpack will be, will be available soon. Backpack on your face. Backpack, uh, box on your face. Um, so so um, in terms of you know, how do we, well, let's go back, the specific question was around how do we the question was your relationship to, um, to, to operators, actually, or on the ground operations, uh, yeah. specifically, specifically for you of hardware. Yes, so, so what's really cool about my, my role, and I, I've only been in this role about six months, but I, I have the opportunity to get to work with and speak with operators that work all across the spectrum and all, and all around the world and learn 
um, from them about how they're approaching the business model and what types of hardware and, and software and other so services they w want and need and how we can help help service that and, and really understand what their business models are and how, how we can we can help work with that. So it's it's a really amazing opportunity to see where the overall market is, where it's going, and, and how everyone's approaching, approaching their business models. But we, we like to partner with them and, and help them make their business a success. So we're deep into deployment right now because we are going to launch in the fall local, but then we're going to launch across the United States and international. And one of the things we're really focusing on is optimization and standardization. And what I mean by that is we know that we need to be slightly hardware agnostic, everything's going to change every year. It's going to, we're going to iterate and change. And so we can't be dependent on any one system. But what we have to do is be able to, we have to be able to deploy and know what the costs are. How can we bring that down so that we can get throughput and the business model is successful? So how do we do our builds, our setups, our cameras? And, and we have to look at, I've done a lot of talk about this, uh, standards that must be met in each location, even across the United States, it's different. ADA compliances, uh, how to do the builds, how to set up for operators in each location, employ them, train them, and standardize it so that you know anywhere you go. Our ideal is anytime you go to a Dreamscape location, it's run the exact same and everything works. That's a big ask and that's a big take on. It's what we're utilizing a lot of our people. We've got brought over a lot of people from Walt Disney Imagineering who have parks experience because that deployment for parks is somewhat of the similar vein in which they know it always has to be up to a certain standard. But then you go to a different country and you have cultural differences and you have different, different ordinances and different things that you need to meet across those that can alter what you have. So in looking at that, we're trying to, we know we're not gonna answer all questions. We know deployment's gonna be a hurdle we're gonna constantly grapple with. We're never going to just be a plug and play, you know, VR experience in a box franchise. It that's not the goal, but we need to be acting in that way so that we make sure that we can keep costs down because that's that's going to be our biggest thorn in our side is um, deployment and operating costs. Content itself, I mean, that's actually not as difficult. You have to scramble and make sure it's always good, but you know how to do that. You know how to get out there, and that's just going to continue to explode, and more creators are going to come on the scene. Deployment of this is always going to be a hurdle. You know, and that's why in, in DD's case, digital domain partnering with DD Spaces, you know, and having a team that is focused on that particular aspect of the job. So they're deploying here in China, expanding into India and beyond, but it's a different skill set, right? And I can't emphasize enough the planning, the focus on a skill set that is retail oriented. Um, you know, we have a team that is very good at building content. I'm not a real t retail expert. I wouldn't necessarily know where to build that location. And then there's a whole ergonomics, user flow, time, you know, through from buying a ticket to sitting to coming back out um, and seeing the planning that goes into that. Uh, and so again, to replicate that model, to make it consistent, to have a design build that you know you're dropping that in there and because of a brand, you want to establish a consistency that keeps keeps going, then you layer on top of that deploying content across all those different locations. We don't have the standards yet. Um, so what you see in a lot of location-based solutions is there's their own content management solution for distributing to their locations. But if you don't figure that out early, you're in, you're in a lot of hurt. Um, and so all of those pieces uh, do typically have come from different sides of the business. And so if you look at folks that are really good at building content, they need to be tempered by the folks that are deploying that content uh, into those spaces. And you know, we talked about IP. Danger of some of the IP is it doesn't always necessarily make sense in a location-based experience. You just can't take a brand name and go, oh, that's going to draw people in. You know, you've got to think about what is the location-based experience, what are you trying to bring people in, and what are they going to do? I wanted to add it to, there's, there's a couple of interesting things. So well, it's, it's a new medium, but on top of that, it's, it's a combination of so many different industries coming together. So even within the content side, it's a combination of the sort of most, I guess all of us here come from more traditional 
entertainment background, but it's that plus gaming, right? And then we plus, 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 and then we and then we layer on the retail or theme park aspect of it, and then we layer on the um, you know then we, you know then we layer on the customer experience aspect from there too. So it's it's a combination of a lot of things. So what's really been interesting is to work with with companies that have gone out to market and then iterated and tweaked and changed their model. And so, you know, one of the companies we've worked with has went out in a bigger way and then realized that wasn't the right model even for throughput. They thought they thought the model was to have more people go through to get positive ROI and then they realized it was actually that they would take up less uh, floor space but have the same ROI if they scaled back half. So it's been interesting to work to work with companies and watch them do that. Um, another example is, is one a company called Dave and, Dave and Buster's, which is pretty well known in the United States. But it's it's a family fun it's a family entertainment center. I think you might, here in China you might refer to it as a theme park because it's it's smaller, but it's it's it's. It's a little bit like a so real, but like a, a so real with a little bit more arcade and food and yeah. So so they just launched about a week or two ago at 112 locations in the U.S., which at, right now in the U.S. that's the most locations of VR anyone has. I, I know by China standards that's not, not would not be the most locations any one company had, but in the U.S. that that's the most. Um, I understand some companies here have like 200 kiosks, so. So that so that's less, but but in the U.S. it's a ve it's a very big um, activation, and it, and it was a combination of uh, well-known IP. So it's Jurassic World from from Universal Pictures, and there's about seven different companies that work worked on it across the ecosystem, from the IP side to the VR creators, is virtual um, v the VRC company to the the motion platform creator to the contractor who brought it together to the headsets with HTC Vive, and then computers came came from us HP. So that's um, and and that what I like about that. Models. They went someplace where people are going to spend money and have fun, which is a family entertainment center. The price is pretty low. It's five dollars. It's a known IP. You don't have to explain to people. At least they're coming there. What Jurassic World is, and you know you can go in there with with four friends, and it's both a, a storytelling experience as well as an interactive. But it's it's family friendly. There's no shooting, no zombies, no, no guns. You're just finding some dinosaurs. But it, but it can be it can get, develop uh, adrenaline because it, it can be scary to have a dinosaur coming at you. So I think that's a really interesting model, but. Um, I think you know we're just so early in seeing you, know, you, got, you guys opened up and you're you're about about to relaunch very soon. But it's it's right. really in, and, and you know, you guys. I mean, every company that opens learns so much from the public. Yeah, I mean, that was with the the pop up. Yeah. We learned a lot, and like you're saying, I mean, one of the things we our, our investors are Westfield Malls and AMC, and we also are working with Math from Dubai. And the malls are very interested in this foot traffic, and so are AMCs. So they're, they are partnering really heavily with us on deployment, and that's going to be a huge help. Even then, no mall is created the same, no floor space in a mall is the same, so we need to be very modular, and we know that. So we are trying to keep maintain our footprint, but then be modular on our gear, gear down, how many theaters we put in, what's our social space that's at each one. So. There's a lot of factors that go into it, and I don't think there's any one answer. I think it's a challenge we're all going to continue to have while we're still trying to grow this business and get an audience to understand what it means so that when they walk by, they instantly get what they're doing. And they're actually intending to go there. They don't just happen upon it. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think the, the takeaway for deployment is uh, that there's actually a very strong um, uh, attention uh, uh, on the either standardization or need for standardization or uh, in the meantime the ability to remain as you said uh, modular and adaptable in the in the deployment Just put of the, the attention experience. I think John said it best if you don't if you don't acknowledge you are not going to be able to scale up and you don't have a team dedicated to that that have have retail experience and have the have the forethought on what's going to happen you're you're not going to make it you can't just look one step ahead on this one mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to move on to um, uh, the relationship that you guys have with uh, third parties and in particular um, uh, creators. How much of it, uh, again, you have very different uh, situations, but how much of uh, creation uh, do you do in-house or do you outsource um, and how, uh, how, how do you work essentially with, uh, with content creators? Um, for us, um, so we're, we're a little bit of, uh, we're sort of a hybrid. So we have our own studio that we create content ourselves. We also partner with others to create content. We co-produce contents. So in, in, at least in our situation, like we had an opportunity uh, last year to go build out, really build out our studio team in a big way, like hiring uh, um, artists and things like that. And I, um, I, I decided I made a call and not to do that because I felt the, 
VR is so new, it's hard for me to tell what kind of production people or what kind of studio people I need. The only thing I know for sure I need are, I need the creative people, I need the people who know how to do boards, who know how to do you know, narrative stories, I know I need the, the TDs, technology people, and I know I need producers and PAs, so to manage the production pipeline, et cetera. Everything else, my philosophy is I'm, I'm outsourcing as much of that as I possibly can, partly because I don't, each of my, each of my productions are different. Some of them are room scale, some of them are 360, some of them have 360 plus interactive. To do some of these things requires different uh, outsourcing partners or, or production partners that I, I don't have to, I don't, I can't staff in house, not just for one project. So, so we do a lot of that. But the thing that we're very core on is, is we are 100% in control of our creatives, and we're 100% in control of the workflow and the production process and the quality that, that goes with it. We're very, very strict about that because we want to make sure that we're not just producing another mediocre product. Um, so so we, we, we work with that, and when we do this with our, uh, uh, our production, with our uh, co-producing partners, we, bring, we think we bring similar strategies to that. Um, most of our co-production partners are studios in China, movie studios in China, where they have a lot of experiences in making content, but not necessarily so in VR. So we have a very good partnership where we take some of their stories, and then we turn them into VR boards, which are different than your traditional film boards. And then we go through a very different narrative process, because we're talking about probably 10 to 20 minutes worth of experiences versus them telling a full narrative story in, in e either on a movie runtime or an internet series runtime. So, so you know, the timing also creates a little bit different. And the other aspect that we bring, I think, that we offer with our uh, production partners is we bring a lot of new technology that they've never seen before. Uh, many of the directors we talk to have never put on a headset before until they start working with us. Uh, so we go through a very interesting um, education process. So we start them actually on uh, Google Spotlight. So the first thing I ask them to watch is some piece of content from Google Spotlight. Because they, they have some really, really great stories that you can take away in, in, in five to ten minutes. Because it dispels one of the... Uh, uh, the, the, the uh, I think one of the roadblocks that the director had that says, I can't tell a story in VR. Well, you know what? If you ever watch Pearl, I'll bet you, you be, that would dispel any of that uh, uh, disbelief. So we want to get through that hurdle, and then we want to get through the technology hurdle of, hey, you know what? I, I don't want to produce something if I can't direct the audience's attention. Well, if you look at some of the Google Spotlights, in a very short way, you can, use, you can see how the creator cleverly uses humor, sound, and others to help with directions. And the director learns a little bit about that as well. So we do a lot of that to educate the, the, the traditional artists and creators to help them make uh, great VR content. Well, we've been lucky enough to support some of the great creators that are in the room from Baobab Studios and Starbreeze and uh, Matias is on another panel right now, so he's not, he's not in the room. Um, but you know, we, we, su we support creators both by um, you know, helping them to, to use our to use our hardware to to create us you know make, make their vision come come real, as well as helping them get to festivals and conferences where they can showcase, um, and we you know we work collaboratively with them to understand how we can continue to improve the technology. I mean, I, th I think we we all know that it's very very early days for the technology, so we want we you know, want to ongoingly keep on. Uh, improving upon it, um, but one of the you know really satisfying and, and great things, is, um, an example would be when we worked with with Hero, which was done by by Starbreeze and, and Ink Stories. One of the creators said you know that prior to having the the technology, the, the backpack technology that they they worked on with, with us, that they weren't able to exhibit their artistic expression and they weren't able to create Hero in the way that they wanted to create when they were tethered with tether, tethered to the computer. And so that the you know seeing seeing and be, being part of an industry where that marriage of technology and creative vision and artistic freedom comes together and is able to create such an amazing piece like Hero, if, which I don't I don't know how many of you guys saw it, but it was at both Sundance as well as Tribeca, and it, it gave the experience of, of what it might be like to be in a, a, a bombing in Syria. Um, 
and it was an incredibly, incredibly impactful piece and, and really you know, helped bring a conversation around that to the forefront. And so um, it's really, it's really a, like an honor to be part, to, to have the technology get to bring some artistic expression and a, and a conversation like that to the forefront. So as far as um, what, how, we, how we create, the question was about finding the right content, right? And what, working with creators. Working with creators. I knew I was going to find it. Just own it. <laughs> Just own it. I'm going to go with it. We do multiple things at Dreamscape. So we definitely have the internal IP, but we don't want to rest on that. And we don't want to generate all stories from within. There are so many good content directors, writers, people who are coming to the table with, so we take pitches a lot. We work with a lot of studios that have con licensed IP and then we start working with people from their brand, the actual creative team that drives that brand and create the episodics or the films that come out of that. We are looking for, we go to the festivals constantly. We're looking for what's out there, who's out there, who has stories to tell. Do they have stories that tell that fit our model? There are an incredible amount of great stories out there. They don't all work within the Dreamscape model because we have a very unique model. So we, are, we want to make sure that it converts to that and we don't deteriorate their product by trying to convert it and we don't deteriorate our brand by trying to do that. But I think content can come from a lot of different places. So we want to find mix of co-productions. We will um, work with new new content creators that come in all the time and we'll create internal. And then we have a really nimble and swift, intelligent dev team in our house. And what we do is we don't want to carry it all the way through the end of production. We create the previs or animatic, whichever term you use. We try and get that build up and running. We stress test that build so that we understand the cadence of the storytelling. We understand making sure we're hitting those points of agency for who the, peop the guests are, that we understand who how they're going to play within that story, how can we utilize the tools that we have at hand. And then we can work with our physical haptics team, and our physical haptics team will then start adding the layers that they need to do it off that build. Once we've got that build ready, we go out to different studios, and we have third-party vendor studios to complete the scenes and bring it back in and integrate it internally. Uh, that, that dem demands getting out there also and meeting with as many vendor studios as we can that understand VR and understand what did we're doing and how to optimize it so that we're not trying to take it back in and do any fixing or changing to it, that we're really getting the best quality and that you always want a vendor studio you hand something to and they bring it back with something even better than you envisioned. You want to up the game. You, if they only do what you ask, it's probably not the right studio. So. It's a, it's a challenge right now, and it's also a slate challenge for us. We have to be, our team should be working on the next three that will go into production after the ones that are currently in production. If they're not hopscotching like that and ahead, we're going to fall behind. So we have Alien Zoo done. We have two that are ready to be guest tested in about three weeks, so they're right on the edge of being done. We have three that are launched into development. That makes me incredibly nervous as head of production because we should have another five after that. We should know what our slate till 2020 is. So it's a two year out game and it's looking at it all long form. So we're out there looking for content. It needs to be good though. What they said. Um, and no, I mean in some cases from uh, Digital Domain's perspective, uh, you know, from the movie side, uh, of our house, we're looking at opportunities where we can leverage that across, uh, you know, taking an IP and working with the, the creators across a number of different genres. So not just a movie, but necessarily looking at so multi-platform, you know, being able to do create a, a VR piece as well as work on a movie. Um, but we're also in some cases a vendor studio, um, so we wear multiple hats. Uh, sometimes we're creating original IP and, and sourcing that, or going into co-production. Co or, or we're you know, out there bidding a particular project and then creating an under a white label scenario. Um, so for us, it's, it's, what I find about, it's exciting about this industry is there's, there isn't one set type, um, but we're, we're constantly attacking from different angles. And I think a, you know, a shop that is just, oh, this is the only business we do is, is sometimes a bit challenging in this very flexible environment. I want to touch upon what Jen said about Slate. So, I mean, Slate to me is probably, if I lose sleep, it's definitely over Slate. It's not over the one piece or the two piece. Because, you know, we all know hit happens and hit doesn't, you can't, sometimes you can't plan for those, right? But, but to me is the way we're thinking about it, because we're also in a distribution as well as production, I'm thinking about is do I have you know, 52 weeks in a week 
do I have any new material that goes out to people like DD Spaces, that goes out to our dome, that goes out to all spaces, et cetera, at least once a week, at least one piece a week. And then you also need to think about, okay, out of the, ideally, what, how, what kind of tempo schedule should I have? So right now, we're, right now we're only able to do one tempo type of project, maybe three to six months, because all the good stuff that's out there that we're able to find, either things that we produce ourselves or others, we're sourcing those things. So we're able to try to build out that particular slate, either thing that we produce or thing that we distribute. I feel like in the LBE, especially in the cinema type of business, if we can't have that kind of a rhythm, it's really hard for this business to scale. Especially if you're thinking about like the average time that you go watch a content in VR, uh, it's around 15 minutes. So num in other words, even one, a piece, one new piece a week is not enough. Because if you want people to get back, you gotta have like three or four new pieces. So when they go in there, they can occupy an hour. Otherwise, they go in there, what's new? 15 minutes and they're done. And they're not gonna come back every week. And then if you're a temple, you're gonna draw them in. You know, it'd be great if I can draw them in every two weeks or every month, but right now it's every couple months. So there's just definitely not enough of that for us to go through. And you know, that, that's the thing that, that keeps me up awake all the time. Well, I think it's, I think you're, you hit on a point also is with, there's just not enough data out there to know what audience tolerance is for when you want to refresh as often as you need to. I mean, you have more data and that's great for us. We're going with what our, we think our programming is going to be. We're going to put something out there and it's going to go through the roof and want to be there a long time. We're going to put something out there. It's going to be okay. It, it'll have its life, but we'll need to refresh. We have to plan for the what if on audience tolerance. I think there's a, there's a couple of factors there, which, uh, as you were touching on it, if you're the type of content or type of experience that you're deploying, right? So there are some LBE experiences that are very arcade oriented. Um, they're shooting games or, or games that you're racking up on leaderboard. And that's a different thing. They may come back week after week to play that game. And, and that's something different than potential viewing content. And then you have your experiences that I think are also depending on like yeah, we, there's one company out there that's got it in Times Square, and they have a constant stream of tourists going through there. They may never see a repeat visitor, but that's okay because you know there's always constant bodies going through there. So I think also where you place that, that experience and what kind of traffic you expect to see through also affects back to what kind of content you're making or what, what you're deploying. I think it's probably interesting for us to talk about since we have like you know, more than half the off, uh, the the audience is, is Chinese and you had mentioned like the different places that we see content in China and how you kind of divide it. and I, I don't know if it'd be interesting for us to talk about you know what we see in America today because it's actually it's actually different yep. than uh, do you want me to jump in? Or, oh, okay. Um, so we have we, we actually the, uh, the VR cinemas that you guys have here we don't we don't have those right now. Um, I, or at least I haven't. I, haven't, I certainly haven't seen them in the, with the same the same way. So we we the, we have our, our, uh, what I guess we, we would call them VR arcades, and those would be essentially what you would you could do at home if you had it at home. Except we don't have a, a high enough uh, sales right now of the at home VR. So people are taking those and putting them in in, in an arcade, and so you might have anywhere between two to four to 10 pods next to each other. And so uh, REST 13, I think it's called, right? Like some, some part of REST 13 would look like that. But, um, and then we have, uh, you, you could be seated, you could be standing, um, and those places may have chairs in them as well. But we, in the US, we don't have the, what, what you guys have here at VR Cinema where you have like 10 to 20 chairs inside a cinema not saying we won't get it at some point, but we don't, we don't have that today. We also don't have the kiosk where you guys have like the, the KTV, I think it's called, and you can go in and you can sing karaoke and then you can play VR at the same time. We, we don't have that either. So we have the arcades where you can do standing or seated. We have, uh, we have free roam where it can be a, a large space and you can go and, and move all around and maybe you play against somebody else and so real has similar similar things to that. So we have those and then we have the next level which is, is what uh, je companies like Jenny's company do where you are multiplayer and you're free roam but when you touch things in the space you, you can feel it in real life so you're, you're overlaying the, the um, tactic experience of real life and, and it's a digital world. Yep. Are there any that we missed? For, just, I think it's probably interesting to learn 
you know, how different markets are, are, are or where, where the different markets are, are today. And like, it was interesting for us to learn from you guys and for you to know where, what we're doing in Amer the US today. Well, that's also the point of those international festivals. Um, uh, we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, we're slightly over schedule, but as you can see, it's a very, very interesting uh, uh, subject. So let's keep talking about it during the, the whole festival. I would like to, to thank uh, all the, the panelists, uh, James, Joanna, Jenny, John, the G group, J group. Um, uh, thank you all for attending, um, and uh, I leave the, the, the stage to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you.